The key to understanding the mathematics of four-dimensional space is an understanding of the associated mathematical objects and problems in three-dimensional space. We study knotted surfaces in four-dimensional space. In three dimensions, knot theory focuses on circles. Placements are equivalent if there is a motion in space that takes one to the other. In geometry, motions are rigid. In topology, we allow flexible motions called isotopies. A round circle is called a trivial knot. This final circle is tilted in view, making it look elliptical. We view this later from a second viewpoint. Presented with a knotting, we might ask, is it equivalent to a trivial knot? If so, there is an isotopy to a round circle called an unraveling. This unraveling has been produced mathematically using knot energy. Think of the knot as composed of points which repel each other so that the closer points are to each other, the stronger the repulsion. The totality of the self-repulsion is a number called energy. We allow the knot to move so that it will always reduce this energy. One expects this reduced energy configuration will be somehow simpler than the original. Spheres knot in four dimensions, much as circles knot in three dimensions. We see the image of this object from four space projected to three space. That is, we display only the first three coordinates of points. As with circles in three space, it is mathematically important that our spheres in four space have no self-intersections. The apparent self-intersections we see are artifacts of our projection process. We visually account for the fourth coordinate with a color code. Points with the highest fourth coordinate are magenta, lowest are blue, other values indicated in the background. All the points of apparent self-intersection have distinct colors, showing true separation in four space. Here is an alternate coloring. It uses more natural colors where the eye has greater sensitivity. Some of the rich information of the projection is hidden from view. We use cutting techniques to view smaller portions of our object. Here we cut in half to show inner detail. Next we look at the construction of this knot. The motion of the path shown is called a twist. We further rotate so that we get one full twist per rotation. This motion is called a one twist. We can do the spinning process in four space and generate a sphere. We need to understand the process of reducing dimensions. We have represented our path by a tube. This permits the use of shading and occlusion to give a three-dimensional appearance. Eliminate the shading and then the thickening and we have visually lost our third dimension. What we see is a moving curve in the plane but we can recover this information by use of color. Color so that points close are magenta, far away are blue, other points according to the code that we see. Now, watch our twisting and note how the colors change at points of the knot consistent with the distance from us. As before, we can turn off the shading and then also reduce our thickening. If we do, we are left with a colored path moving in the plane. This is the projection of the twisting. This is a reduction of dimension. It is exactly this scheme which allows us to take the projection of a surface into three space and encode the projected fourth coordinate. If we cut this twice, we have only a middle strip. If we let it move, what we see is familiar two joined copies of the two-dimensional projection we have just seen. Mathematically put, the projection of the twist spinning is the spinning of the projection of the twisting. A lot easier to see than to say. We now see in projection, of course, the unraveling of our sphere in four space produced by an energy minimization flow. We represent our surface as triangulated. An energy is then calculated based on the vertices of these triangles. At each pair of vertices, there is a repulsion causing them to want to move apart. This motion is then constrained by requiring the area of the sphere remain constant. The software used for our calculation is the surface evolver written by Ken Brackey. Color changes of the points indicate motions in the fourth coordinate. Note the final position is an ellipsoid 
in four dimensions. This is, in fact, a sphere, and we will later see this. We could also have deduced this from the color coding that we see. Our projection makes this look ellipsoidal in much the same way that our first unraveling circle seemed to end in an ellipse. In 1965, Zeeman showed that any twist spun knot is truly knotted except in the case of a single twist. His proof of the unknottedness of the one twist spun is both elegant and indirect. Here, we see explicit computational verification. Here is exposed our original triangulation. Note that there are slight irregularities and changes in the triangulation during the unraveling. Although we use several different energies here, all based repulsion on the inverse fourth power of the distance between vertices. The energy repulsion locally tends very strongly to force our triangulation into a pattern of equilateral triangles six to a vertex. But for a sphere, this is a mathematically impossible triangulation. Small but important adjustments this entails generate technical problems both computationally and in graphic presentation. Graphically, the triangulation gives pattern to the surface, which gives visual information of the motion we see. As we watch this again, we bring up a mathematical problem. In order that we verify we are in fact watching an isotopy, we need to check that there are no self-intersections of any image at any time. As we watch, we can pay close attention to the visible self-intersecting set and see that the sheets, as they seem to cross, have different colors. But of course, we know that there are details which we cannot see. To shorten our presentation here and elsewhere, we do not show the less interesting final stages of our unraveling, but stop here. For reference, we will call this the simple twist stage. In fact, this is an almost round sphere with a simple twist in four dimensions. Contemplation of this is an aid to the understanding of details of the more complex images we have seen. We can cut our problem in half and get another view and carefully check the color as we have before. But even so, this is not an easy task. Interesting as this is to watch, it would clearly be best to focus on an even smaller portion of our motion for our verification purposes. What we will do in our next sequence is to cut this by a second plane. The advantage is that we will aid in our verification, but the disadvantage is we will lose the broad context of what it is that we are viewing. Here is the sliced part of our projection, but we can also view this as a projection of a slice. In four-dimensional space, there are two three-dimensional hyperplanes projecting to these two slicing planes in three space. If we cut our sphere in four space and view the portion between these hyperplanes, then the result, when projected as we have, will look no different than what we are viewing. But there are other projections from four space to a three-dimensional space. Using these, we get a much different picture. We could simply eliminate some coordinate other than the fourth one. That is what we will consider next. By taking the object in four space and projecting it in a different direction, we will get a different view of it. We have gone from a self-intersecting band to one with no self-intersections. To understand this process, we look at a knotted circle and its projection on the viewing plane. Cut it by planes which, to our view, are seen edge on and consider a center slice. This slice projects with self-intersections, and it seems we have gained little in the process. But if we project to a different direction, then we see we have no self-intersections. Of, of course, it never did have self-intersections. It was only our point of view which made it seem so. Now we put everything together. We watch the portion of our unraveling, which is contained between two close parallel hyperplanes in four space. We show this unraveling repeatedly forwards, then backwards. This way, we can view several times without discontinuity of motion. We are projecting in a direction different than our usual one. This way, we see very directly that there are no self-intersections at any time for our portion of the unraveling. Furthermore, we rotate everything in three-dimensional viewing space. This allows us to view in the most natural way to make sure that there are never self-intersections. We keep our color coding the same as before because it helps us look for trouble spots. If there were improper self-intersections, then by our color coding, the two improper pieces would be of the same color. Keeping the color helps us quickly eliminate the need for detailed investigation of much of what we see. The merging that we see does not constitute self-intersection. Showing the triangulation makes this point clearer. 
Experts may recognize this as a saddle point in the time parameter. This changing sequence of two-dimensional surfaces in three space is a method of analysis that is natural and mathematically useful. We have now looked very carefully at these pictures. However, let us not forget this is still not the whole story. We have not yet examined other portions of our unraveling. The computation of the knot energy in four dimensions is intensive. The unraveling we have been examining takes two to three weeks of calculation on a powerful workstation. Similar calculations applying knot energies to more complex problems have taken months. Some more interesting calculations would take years using current techniques and machines. But we expect parallel computation and increasing machine speed to help with some of these problems in the near future. Let us go back and examine our a single initial sphere. We will use slicing by hyperplanes in four-dimensional space, but this time we use a sequence of hyperplanes. We divide the entire sphere into small, understandable portions. For the moment, we go back to our original projection by the fourth coordinate. So we represent our knot as a sequence of slices. Here we show these slices taken apart and separated. We will do this for the other images we see as well. What we need to do now is to see how these slices fit together. We show this next. We note in passing that the first and the last slices are not that interesting. This is true in general and allows us to cut down our work a bit. So now, here then is our plan. We will divide four-dimensional space by hyperplanes at each point in time and use these to cut our sphere into pieces. We will then use these to produce a sequence of animations as we have just seen. Each of these animations will be viewed by a projection which will make visual the absence of self-intersections. Then, one by one, we watch these animations. We have already done this with one central slice. If we do not find a problem with any animation, then we have verified that in fact we have an isotopy. We will now do this. The first animation we view is not from the first slices, since as we mentioned, these do not contain a lot of useful information. Here's the second one. To simplify things, we do not rotate as we did before. These are now viewed from a static position. The motion that we see is the actual motion of these in four dimensions. As we watch these animations, let's pause to consider what we are seeing. We are using computer graphics to do real mathematics, to verify relationships between mathematically defined objects. We have spent a lot of time talking about four-dimensional space and how to visualize it. Let us think for a moment about the problems of visualizing five-dimensional space. It might at first seem that this must be very difficult to do, but the fact is that in a way, that's exactly what we have been doing. We have looked at isotopies of two-dimensional spheres in four-dimensional space. When we study an isotopy, we really add a dimension of time to both the object and the space in which it travels. Thus, an isotopy of a sphere in four space really corresponds to a three-dimensional subset of five-dimensional space. A few comments about the graphics that we are watching right now. We show this with the shadowing algorithm turned off. For video, this gives the clearest picture of the colors, since we can still detect occlusion. Another reason is that a shading algorithm by nature changes color values of points on a surface, and this could disturb the color map. For casual viewing, this is not a great problem, but since we are interested in accuracy, perhaps we should do it this way. Color, as we have seen, can be very useful for encoding information. However, it may not work very well in all situations, so we have been exploring other methods. Our current efforts lie in the use of texture to encode other dimensions. 
The basic idea is to use a large texture for large numbers and small textures for small numbers. There is no need to completely eliminate our color coding as well, so in this example that we see, we will have the color coding and the texture coding. Imagine ourselves as above this object in four-dimensional space. Then high values will be close to us and will be represented by large textures. These others are lower down, and finally the blue, of course, is farthest away with the finest texture. Look. Using this, one can quickly decide the relative fourth coordinates at these triple points here and here. Also distinguish the relative heights of these two surfaces. Here we rotate to get a better look. Notice that sometimes the bumps go in, sometimes go out from the surface. This is an added bonus, since it allows us to distinguish the two sides of the sphere as we see it. But once again, let us understand that the large features represent points that are close to us in the fourth dimension. The small features are things that are far away, and the intermediate ones have intermediate values. What we are watching here is one of our unraveling pictures as it's textured. Particular unraveling has as its final stage a very round form. Here's a second textured animation. We will see this in two forms. The first that we're watching now, we will see with both the color and the texture. Then we will see it later with only the texture. Note that the bumps move, with the large bumps making large motions, the small bumps making small motions. This helps in reinforcing our distance mapping and uses the eye's built-in sensitivity to texture and motion. We have looked carefully at a surface in four space and a mathematically significant isotopy of it. Two things are new. We have seen new computer graphic techniques that can help in our understanding of higher dimensions. We have seen how not energies can produce non-trivial mathematical simplifications. In each of these we see potential, but these are in fact interesting first steps.